Hello, I'm David Hepworth. Thanks for clicking this word in your ear. The latest of hundreds of chats Mark Ellen and I have had over recent years, some between ourselves and others with musicians, authors, comedians, and other people we like. If you'd like to help make sure they continue, you might consider being a Patreon supporter by visiting patreon.com slash word in your ear or just by liking or subscribing in whatever way you prefer. On with the show. You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Dave, I have a stack waddy for you, if you fancy it. Hooray. Yeah, I was reading Simon Raymond's uh, of the Cocteau Twins memoir, because we're going to talk to him next week. Very good, actually. Uh Very good, called In One Ear. And uh, in it was a bit of information I didn't know. You probably knew it. His dad... Ivor Raymond. Ivor Raymond wrote what song? Well, he will have written... God, I mean, he kind of arranged and so forth for Dusty Springfield and uh, people like that, didn't he? Yeah. Um, He was a name that you often saw on credits, certainly in the 60s and 70s. But go on. Tell no, me. he wrote, I only want to be with you. The dusty hit. Of course they Joe yeah. wrote, her, which I, her, I kind her, of... Her first hit. Her yeah, first if hit. I knew that, I'd forgotten it. I thought it was really interesting. I thought there might be a stack waddy in, uh, in occupations of uh, pop stars' parents. Okay. <clears throat> so I have ten. Good. Nine of which are true. And one is a crisp work of fiction cooked up by me. And you have to identify... Which one is the ringer? Okay, here they come. Michael Stipe's father was a military helicopter pilot in Korea. Uh, Carry on. Okay. It's a true or false. Tom York's dad was a nuclear physicist and chemical equipment salesman. Okay. Next up, PJ Harvey's parents owned a quarrying business (laughs) By an Iron Age hill fort in Somerset. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to work out now, am I going against type or for type? You know, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Richard it, Thompson's father, you yeah, know this, I know this, was a Scotland Yard detective. Yeah, yeah. Toya Wilcox's mother was a professional dancer and Western supermare in the late 50s, performing with Flanagan and Allen. Wow. <laughs> okay. David Crosby's dad was a World War II military intelligence officer. Paddy McAloon's mum made the lunar landscape inhabited by the TV stop-motion stars The Clangers in 1974. Okay. Oh, dear. Two to go. Jimmy Page's dad was a personnel manager at a plastics coating plant in Heston. Yeah. And lastly... Marcus Mumford's dad was an international leader of the neo-charismatic evangelical Christian Association of Vineyard Churches. <laughs> there they are. Oh, my goodness. One of those is not true. Well, God, I only know one is true for a fact, and that's Richard Thompson's father was a policeman. Heads um, was it Emil and the Detectives. What was the, what was the group he had with Hugh Cornwall at school? Emil and, Emil the, and the Detectives. It's just from based Tinsley. on Based on yeah. a well-known French children's book, isn't it? Yeah, I it is. To remember, yeah. um, I'm going to say that your ringer is. Tell me again what Toya Wilcox's mother was supposed uh, to. Uh, Toya Wilcox's mother was a professional dancer and Western supermare in the late fifties, performing with Flanagan and Allen. I'm thinking you've made that up, that one up. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. I didn't make it up. It's no. amazing, isn't it? I just I just picked on some people who th- I thought might have interesting parents. It's a, good idea. it's a good idea. And I think that her dad, I think her dad first saw her mum when she was in that act at Western Supermare. Very good. Uh, dancing with Flanagan and Allen, instantly fell in love with her. I just thought it was so absolutely what you'd expect. It was utterly on brand. If you think what Toya Wilcox is like now, I saw her on a television program the other night and she couldn't, couldn't stop getting out of the chair and just she dancing. Can't. She's so physical. And she so is kind born of in a trunk in a travelling show. She Absolutely. Is, really. Absolutely. Yeah, so, no, that's true. And um, they're all true, apart from Paddy McAloon's mum 
making the lunar landscape inhabited by the TV <laughs> stop motion stars, so the, the clangers, which I just made up. You made just that thought, one up. It's the sort of inventive thing they might have done. It's funny, looking at all those, I was thinking you either go against type. I mean, it's like against type is Jim Morrison's dad was a naval rear admiral in the Vietnam War, yeah. which he was. He and that's was. kind of, God, really? You know, yeah. Or else you go completely along with type. I looked up Björk. And I thought it was just too, it was too obvious what her mum, her mum was, it was, and I think possibly still is, an activist, a political activist at, at, for a living, pretty much, and protesting against Iceland's hydropower plants. That is precisely what you want Björk's mum to be doing. Yeah, you'd be a bit disappointed if she works in Tesco's, wouldn't you, really? You would be. Um, it wouldn't be right. No, it wouldn't be right. That's very good. That's good stuff. So but you, there they you, are. You so, uh, yeah, but, uh, I win. Very uh, rare moment, I win. And talking of Toya, you know, as I every time I think about Toya, I always think the same thing. You could do a really good film about Toya, actually. Really you good really kind could. of feature film about Toya. The Strange Life of Toya Wilcox. No we way. interviewed her, didn't we? Oh, God, yeah. And she was fantastic and yeah. talked about, I think, working at one point in a, in a uh, department store. <clears throat> I think maybe in the makeup department. But she did all that. kinds of mad things. She was a yeah. tearaway as a teenager, complete yeah. tearaway. And now, now she's still, you know, every time I go on YouTube, there she is in her kitchen prodding around Robert Fripp, you know, kind know. Of to, to do kind of uh, remarkable things to in order to sell tickets for, uh, you know, their joint tour or whatever. It's It really is, you know, open the fridge door and she's on telly kind she's of thing. Right. You know, she just is. She's sees the light. And, you know, and I, I'm sorry, I don't, don't want to be ungentlemanly about this, but how old is she? You know, and oh, yeah, I don't know. it's going to be in, well in her 60s, surely. Probably 65, I don't know, um, yeah. I mean, she looks fantastic on it. Yeah, she know. does. Um, but doesn't appear to have, there's no sign that she kind of slowed down in any respect, is there? You know what I mean? Normally Not people do. <laughs> she's, if anything, she's even more, um, even more lively than she was forty years ago, more than forty years ago. I think so. Yeah, and, and she was regular. So. Yeah, not not remotely kind of wound up by anything. Then she was a bit cautious and a bit self conscious. She's not now. She's thinking, I'm still doing it. I'm whatever, sixty five. Yeah. She's brilliant, I think. And she's and also it, one of those people who Claire Grogan's another, and I really like this about them, is that they just they once there's an audience, they're on. Aren't they? Absolutely. They walk into a room and they're on. Completely. And they can't they probably can't function function to some extent without an audience, actually. No, absolutely. They just need it. Yeah. Uh, hence, hence uh, social media stepping in for her, when she hasn't actually got one. She's putting some link up. But she's great, I think. So talking of the 80s, that's a rather you know, clanky segue, but it's the best I can do. What's going on with Morrissey and Marr and the, and the, and the name of the Smiths, Mark? Are you up to date with this? Well, I'm reasonably up to date with this. As far as I can see, what happened is that the, the, the big story is that, that Ma put up a statement, didn't he, on his uh, <clears throat> on his website, and he made it clear because Morrissey had basically Morrissey had alleged that Ma had successfully applied for the ownership of the band's name without any consultation and without giving him the chance to object. That's what Morrissey had claimed, and also that Ma had ignored offers of live performance. And Ma eventually just put up this thing saying, "Look, what actually happened was he asked Morrissey to help protect." the band's name, the Smiths. Morrissey didn't respond. When he sorted out the ownership of the Smiths' name, he then asked Morrissey to sign a joint agreement so they could both legally own the name, and Morrissey still hasn't signed it. So he said he was forced into owning the band's name to prevent people exploiting it. Morrissey had then said he'd ignored these tour offers. He said he didn't ignore them. He just said no. And since then, I, I understand that Morrissey has sacked his management. <laughs> No, well, okay. I don't know. I don't know if this is blame. I don't know himself. I don't know if this has changed since um, you looked into it. But the thing I read, which I've, I've, I was surprised at, is that uh, Morrissey and Marr have been approached with an offer about a reformed Smiths tour, hugely yeah. lucrative, and, and Morrissey had said yes. Oh, really? And then, then Marr had obviously. <laughs> Ed, Ed felt it would. He didn't even need to say no. It was pretty obvious he wasn't going to do it. You know, yeah. uh, on the grounds of I don't know, 
Morrissey's politi- political aff- affiliations or whatever it was. It is just an extraordinary can of worms, isn't it? And I was just well, looking- beyond his political affiliations, because it's just like, what would it be like to be working with him? If that's an indication, if that idea that he puts up publicly three allegations about Ma, all of which are manifestly untrue, then what what's everyday life like when you try to agree? The songs every- you're going to have in the set list, the way you're going to play, you know, who's in the bar. I mean, I just, I just don't really, you wouldn't want, the other, I mean, Morrissey, here's another example, isn't it? Morrissey's album, you know about the album Bonfire of the Teenagers? Well, this is one he, 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 this is one he claims has been kind of suppressed. <laughs> yeah, well, he made that record, I think, in 20, 2020, yeah. wasn't it? it was four oh, years it was longer, ago. yeah. And various remember. labels were lined up and looked like they were interested. For whatever reasons, you can probably imagine some, they decided not to do it. Um, he has eventually bought the record back, I think, from the last per- people who owned it, which were Capital. So he owns the record. And the record was obviously really controversial. There's a track on it. Well, the title track, isn't it? It's about the 2017 Manchester Arena bombings. Which he describes as England's nine eleven. So you're you're in really complicated territory already, and you can see why people would be cautious. Anyway, he owns that record, but his whole thing is yes, it's been suppressed. You know, is the world is somehow keeping, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the the record companies, the record industry is keeping the world from this record. It's not true. It's obviously he is keeping it. I mean, if he owns it, couldn't he put it out? I can't see why not. Well, loath as I am to show any sympathy with him, the, I, I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the situation shopping around a Morrissey record in this day and age is a bit like trying to trying to get a publisher to to put out Woody Allen's memoirs. You know what I mean? Yeah, and they, yeah. And they, Hachette, I think, were initially supposed to do Woody Allen's memoirs. And then there was a kind of rebellion. It was an internal rebellion. Internal and rebellion. people said they wouldn't work in the company it's if they had to be involved insane, with it. It's insane, you know. And they just and, uh, came in, didn't they? It, it ended up on another publisher. And I read it. It's a very good book, actually. Anyway, um, um, but... You know, the whole business of shopping records around is not what it was because the record business is not what it was. And it's not going to be worth anything like what it was. No. And you're not going to get anybody to make a fuss about you. And uh, and you would undoubtedly have a kind of rebellion down in the staff canteen, down in the staff coffee shop, <laughs> if you if you, you propose would. putting out a Morrissey album. But he, he and there's, I'm sure there's a million ways Morrissey could put an album out if he, if he wanted to. But really, the truth is, you know, given the choice between a course of action and making a fuss around a course of action, Morrissey will choose the latter option in absolutely every case which is make a fuss. Because what he cannot bear to think is that he's kind of the same as everybody else. You know what I mean? What he likes to be, he likes the idea of controversy around his head. He adores that idea. He loves that's it. What, that's what gets him up in the morning. You know? It does. And uh, so, you know, if, he, if, the, if he things are going quiet for Morrissey over, over a couple of years, all you do is, you know, you look at that little wasp nest called, which is labeled Johnny Marr on the outside, and you take a stick and you stick it inside the wasp <laughs> nest, and you go, bugger me, wasps will come out, you know. Um, that's that's what he does, you know. And uh, they are they are kind of like, you know, they're like Jack Lemon and Walter Matow in the odd couple, aren't they? Now, they are. you, you kind of feel that they ought to pass their – their later life, sharing an apartment somewhere, you know. That's right, just quite softly winding each other up. <laughs> you know, with, with kind of, with the fridge divided, you know, with with everything in the fridge. <laughs> Morrissey's, hands off, Mars, I've marked this kind of thing, you know, with open water. That's right, water. The little markers on the level of the milk. A little note saying, <laughs> my cheese, <laughs> hands off. That's this a, is a movie that's got to be made. It's a comedy movie, isn't it? It's a, it's a Morrissey and it's Mar. It's a tragedy. It's a, it's a, a tragic comic, comedy. comic tragedy. Um, but anyway, on the subject of band names, on the subject of band names, the subject it, of band names yeah. the, you know, it is remarkable how, you know, the Smiths has been a, a name that's been out there in the public arena for, what, 45 years or something like that? Maybe not quite that long, but more than forty, and and 
still until recently the the kind of the ownership of that name the protection of that name was not clear which is it's really interesting you know and i think this applies with lots of bands probably the overwhelming majority of bands because you know they have they get a name and you know they arrive they they are they've had five different names and then they arrive at one that they're kind of happy with and then i don't know they have a little bit of success with it and once you've got a little bit of success with it, you know you're not going to change it. You're taking it. your eye off everything else. Because all you're well, thinking about is the next single and whether I'm going to have a songwriting credit on it and can we do that tour and who got the most quotes in the NME interview. And, and you know, also the, they're really young. I mean, I can't remember how old Johnny Marr was when they signed. I think I think he was about 18 or 19. <clears throat> so that's pretty young, isn't it? Um, but, and, they, but, uh, and I think they've complained in the past about the – the uh, slightly ruinous uh, uh, contracts that they got involved with where they felt that the profits weren't high enough. And I'm sure that was the case. But it just seemed absolutely amazing that they're, they're but, there at this stage of their lives thinking that oh, we better secure the name of the group. But the practical steps you need to take to protect a band name are slow and expensive. Yeah. You know, because you can only protect it territory by territory. So, you know, if you had a manager and a lawyer or whatever said, oh, okay, well, we're doing quite well, you know, we, we think we should protect the name, they'd say, well, it's going to cost you 200 quid per territory or something like that. And that's without the lawyers and so forth. And then you're yeah. going to have to protect it in different categories. So you, you could protect the Smiths as a band, but could you protect the Smiths as, I don't know, a cartoon strip or a movie or whatever? Well, that's a separate registration. So... To, to, to utterly nail down the ownership of a name, it's probably a million pounds if you add it up. You know? And then nobody's going nobody's gonna to pay that. You know, there's never going to be the moment at which you think, now is the time you know, to take a deep breath, spend a million pounds and protect the name. People don't do that. So they just kind of carry on. And, um, the, you know, Ma took steps a couple of years ago to protect it um, because there was somebody else planning to do something with the name, wasn't there? That's uh, right. And I suppose given the kind of, given the Rick Astley situation and all that, you know, you could probably, you could probably see people approaching that area. You know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting Rick Astley was up to anything. Underhand. No, but you're talking oh. about Rick Astley touring Smith songs with yeah, the Blossoms, just, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, and just yeah. basically be, being the Smiths. Oh, you, you know? could add stage musical, you know. Yeah, something. yeah. Um, you know, you could start thinking about that that kind of but thing. But maybe if that amount of money is involved, that could be another factor. It's it's a, it's a possibility. I mean, Morrissey might be saying, "I want to own this, uh, the the co-own the the rights to the name," and then Johnny Mars come back to him with a contract, pointing out that it cost a million pounds to sort well, out, yeah, requiring I'm half just, a million pounds on Morrissey. I'm, I'm I mean, just, I know that's a guess on your part, but it probably is a lot of money. It, it maybe it's something else he hadn't factored in. Who knows? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. And you know, given given the choice between believing Morrissey and believing Ma on the basis of absolutely no, you know, no prior knowledge. I, I'm going to believe Ma pretty much every time. Oh, every <laughs> time. <laughs> because, you know. He seems like a sound <laughs> individual. <laughs> Whereas on Morrissey, clearly he doesn't. I um, know. But, you know, it is extraordinary, isn't it? The same. I know, because they're inches away from Nick Turner's Hawkwind and, you know, yeah. Martin Turner's Wishbone Ash. And the original Temptations. Yeah. The original Temptations. And, and Yes featuring John Anderson, Trevor Rabin and Rick Wakeman. Well, wasn't that what the group were called at one point? I think they were. I think they were. And then Roger Waters, the creative genius behind, the behind Pink, Pink, Floyd. Floyd. Pink Floyd. Talking to bands, uh, I did a thing the other night for my book at a bookshop in Ballam. I haven't told you this, actually, Mark. Go on. And uh, and there were a lot of people in this bookshop. It was it was sold out, Mark. Um, and As it should be. You're quite right. As and it always uh, is. There you go. <laughs> and um, and in the kind of questions and Q and A, you know, back and forth at the end of it, 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 the inevitably the subject of Oasis came up, and you know. I, I punted out my line that Oasis are the last of the kind of household name bands. And um, and somebody said, well, what about Coldplay? And, you know, I, I said, and here's an interesting thing. There must have been 80 people in this place. And they're all kind of music fans. 
Is, is there anybody in this room who can name all four members of Coldplay? Silence. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I thought it was really interesting. First time yeah. I've ever done that. I, I give them warning now if I'm doing future things. Somebody, the teacher, somebody will go along and write, write it down. <laughs> You'll be throwing I, chalk at people next. <laughs> no, but I thought, I thought, that's really interesting, isn't it? People couldn't even come up with one more, one other than Chris Martin. Has there ever been a group who've achieved such globe-girdling success? with so little personal awareness. It's absolutely amazing, isn't it? Actually, it's astonishing because I'm thinking now, David, I can't do it either. That's <laughs> it's terrible, just, isn't it? It's well, just, I'm not unaware of Coldplay. I am. I, yeah. I know and reasonably like some of their songs. And people, be, yeah, quite. Nothing against Coldplay at all. Heck, and but I've even been to see them. And, <laughs> I went to see them. I remember about 2008 at the O2. Simon Pegg played a harmonica solo. He's a mate of theirs. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> and I still can't. <laughs> that is extraordinary, isn't it? It is something, isn't it? That's extraordinary. Whereas absolutely everybody has heard of of Oasis and can name obviously two members. Well, two, if members. not, if not more, you know. If but, not more. Uh, but you can usually two. they can usually do Bonehead Arthur's because it's just yes. so memorable. Yes, <laughs> Bonehead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this week. We has seen the, the final daily print edition of the Evening Standard, which has been the kind of fact of London life, certainly for as long as I've lived in London. And, um, and um, you know, I can even remember, I don't know if you remember, Mark, when there were two evening papers in London. You remember the Evening News? The evening News? The evening Standard. And I think I'm right in saying that the Evening News was used to, used to publish an edition on Saturday, which the standard didn't do. I don't it think. did, and, and there uh, used to be a place near where we worked in Smash Hits in Carnaby Street. There used to be a guy selling it. You used to go, "Lady, you mean standard?" Standard. You remember that guy? Yeah. <laughs> and he just it sent me to thinking of kind of disappeared things, things that have gone from London life in the time you and I have been kind of, uh, you know, um, in and around London. And just how many of those things were just such such facts of life? You know, and you're thinking about your news vendor. And um, and I was thinking about just how many of our, of our kind of habits were built around regular media con- consumption. Because nowadays when you consume media, you're doing it all the time. You're doing it on your laptop or your phone or yeah, absolutely anything. Whereas that didn't used to be the case. You used to have to go somewhere at certain times, you know, to do it. And um, do you remember the feeling you used to get, Mark, from turning the corner down from the London Palladium into Great Marlborough Street, and you would be greeted by the sight of that cornucopia of magazines from all over the world, who's on that magazine stand opposite Liberty's department store. Yeah, they had a um, a little kind of washing line with clothes pegs that they used to peg yes. the magazines on. Do you remember that? Yes, new I, things. I find that so thrilling. So thrilling. Um, and you, you, you know, because you wouldn't just have UK magazines; you'd have magazines from all over the world. You know, yeah, I don't know, Entertainment Weekly or Rolling Stone or Italian Vogue, or that was just so exciting, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, do you, you ever used to get a Maroni's um, a magazine stand down uh, what's Old Compton Street, isn't it? Um, oh, did it specialise in it's not Italian there and fashion magazines? But it's special in magazines. It's still there, actually. Get, it's yeah, still there. Oh, well, I'm I thought, sure I thought it did close quite recently, but I may be completely wrong. Oh, right. Um, Great thick fashion magazine. But, but not just the fashion magazines, but, you know, also, I suppose it's a, it's a kind of, it's a leftover from Soho's kind of cosmopolitan past. So, yeah. you know, if Italian waiters working in Soho wanted to read you know, Corriere della Sera or whatever, you know, Italian newspaper, whatever, they were, they were going to Maroni's and do it, you know. And so you could just get, you could spend, you could stand in Maroni's for 90 minutes just going through things and just just 
being absolutely enthralled by them. And I think it's very sad that you can't do that anymore. No, it, no. It, only, it only just struck me, you know, in the in the light of the Evening Standard uh, going, you know, that, um, you know, and we talked before about the magazine stand or the newsstand that used to be down in, um, in Oxford Circus Underground, which was the place you could go to get the NME on a Wednesday lunchtime. Uh, all those kind of things. Did you ever walk down Fleet Street when mag- when newspapers were still printed down Fleet Street? Yes, I did, yeah. Did you ever walk down there late on Saturday night? Unbelievable. One of the most evocative things. I only did it once, Mark, but I can transport myself back to it right now in my head. I think that's when my parents, I think we were visiting London, London and we just... We'd been for a meal or something. We ended up walking down Fleet Street. And, of course, in those days, you could look down into the basement underneath the Daily Express and the Daily Telegraph where the presses would be whirring, you know what I mean? That incredible Oh, I never sound. saw that. Extraordinary. And then at the side, the, the, you know, the, 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 the loading bay would open and out would zoom vans, you know, with these – Copies of the newspaper, fresh off the press, going straight to the um, the railheads, you know, Paddy yeah. and, and you know, Houston. Isn't it amazing so, that they actually printed them on the premises? I mean, that was never the case with any of our magazines. You sent everything off, all okay. the artwork off on a motorbike. No, no. no they, in those days, and here I'm talking about, what am I talking about? The early 60s, I suppose. You yeah. know, that they, they would be preparing the Daily Express on the fourth floor, and then they would be typesetting it down in the basement and, uh, you know, yep. actually actually printing it down there. And do you remember the other, the other thing? Um, did you did you ever go to King's Cross Station late at sat- on Saturday night to get a Sunday newspaper? You get the they, Sunday newspapers, yes. You could get the Observer <sighs> and Sunday Times and everything. For some reason, they were there first, weren't well, they? Well, the reason they were there is they were going to the rail points to, to be sent yeah, to get, Glasgow yeah. or Yorkshire or whatever, you know. Um and so yeah, yeah, there would be piles of these things. Um, so people would go there who are desperate to see what the review of their, you know, the record companies would go and they'd see what the review of the album would be like. Well, or or if you were Johnny Freelance, you had some tiny little Yeah, you had piece. some tiny little piece. Did they spell my name right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Sunday, Sunday newspapers on a Saturday night was such a thrilling thing. Yeah, it, used, it was. It used to happen in New York. Yeah, you know, you wander around Greenwich Village on – Saturday night, and they, their vans would pull up, and they'd chuck out these absolutely household pet threatening bolts. Yeah, bales of massive print copies of the New York Times, um, and you would you know pick up one uh, to take back to your hotel, um, and it would be absolutely huge. I do kind of miss all those things. Those I sort miss, of rituals. I miss old London. I was thinking about it. I miss old. I was reading this. Th- Piece in by uh, Zoe Williams and the Guardian oh, right, yeah. about what it was like working. Which I just I sent it to you. It was about working at the at um, the Evening Standard in the 90s. It was so nostalgic, just how how incredibly rude everybody was to each other in the office, and how she didn't mind because we were drunk all day. You know, it's just so funny the whole thing. But you ever, I, I got you ever work in an office where people were drunk all day? Did you ever? Did you ever? Have that no, but I, that's what they always said about Fleet Street, and I always thought it sounded hilarious. You know, <laughs> that they were people would go out and have three pints at lunchtime and come back. Actually, having said that, no, I worked at the NME. What am I talking about? Yes, God, oh, God, the NME. They're drinking at the NME. Danny Baker. <laughs> I came back and I don't know if I can mention his name now because it seems unkind. But the film editor said, I said, I want to write some film reviews. He said, okay, well, you have to go through a bit of an audition first. You know, I've got to ask you about films and how much you know. So we'll go out to the Blue Post on Tuesday. We went out to the Blue Post on Tuesday. He drank seven pints of lager. Jeez. I think I drank four and I was absolutely <laughs> out of my head. But <laughs> seven pints of lager. They went back and wrote hilarious captions to his uh, his piece about uh, Klaus Kinski or whatever it would have been. When I was, I, I did some work with um, People Magazine in the United States, and uh, so I spent some time in the Time Life Building, as it was in those oh, yeah. days on on Sixth, I think it was, um, opposite Radio City Musical, and they'd have you know the Time office, you know, one floor and Sports Illustrated, and I don't know what people and these things. And they were still there, people there who can remember, and I think it still possibly went on, on the, on press days when people couldn't 
couldn't leave their desks because you know they had to pass the magazine. Yeah, cocktail waiters would make their way from desk across the floor, desk, floor. saying, "What would you like?" You know, Possibly a little thing of, uh, of olives. <laughs> That's absolutely extraordinary. The smash hits wasn't like that. No, the smash hits definitely oh, not. Lord. But I was, no, no, we were, I was, we were very sober. But I, I mean, mean, I think old London. I just, I look back at that now, and it's so. The Hare Krishnas. Do you remember the Hare yeah, Krishnas? Oh, God. Come down, down Carnaby Street. Are they still their, around? Their drums. The Hare Krishna kind of temple cafe is still there, isn't it? Just oh, off is it? Soho. I think it is, just off Soho Square. Oh, yeah. Which I once went in there because uh, long before that was a big thing, people said, oh, you can get a really good vegetarian meal in there. I went yeah. in there and it was really good. But I don't I don't see them marching up and down Oxford Street as much as they used to do. Maybe they, maybe they still do that. Um but no, no the, I, go the on. guy knows the protein man. You remember him? The protein man. I looked like Ivor Cutler with a little cap on. He used to walk up and down Oxford Circus. And he had a he had a banner that said, "Less passion from less protein, less fish, birds, eat uh, meat, cheese, eggs, beans, nuts, and sitting." Yeah, and I sitting. can remember that and thinking, "This is." And he had a little pamphlet you could buy for something like I don't know two p. Didn't he have? Am I right in thinking? He had the, he had this permanent banner. It was kind of metal of some kind. Yeah, and, and he he belatedly, and it was listed all the things if you, as you've said, all the things that he he felt that too much protein led to or whatever. Um, and then he at some stage he wanted to do a pen to something, and so because he couldn't be bothered to repaint the whole thing, he hung off a little That's right. addendum. Yeah, hung by a chain, it. and it said, and sitting. Yeah, and sitting, that was it, and sitting. He decided that was part of his whole less passion <laughs> thing, wasn't it? He'd forgotten the sitting, and it was a little extra thing that swung, actually, as he walked along. Oh, dear. Oh, Lord. Oh, I, I love, remember all that. I love and also, all I, remember, that. I remember the fact that all derelict buildings were covered in flyers for gigs. <laughs> That's true. Propagated iron covered in flyers. You know, there's always Shams something. Shams 69. Members. Yeah. Yes. We're playing a local <laughs> operator. We're going to be at the Hope and Anchor on Tuesday or something. I loved all that. That's true. That's really true. Do you remember, did you ever avail yourself of the services of the Daily Telegraph Information? Yes. Site? Oh, yeah, we use that all the time. That, that actually, interesting, that was the kind of Wikipedia of its time, wasn't it? Daily it was Telegraph internet. Information Service. If you wanted to... If you want of the internet, if you want to check a fact, you rang them, didn't you? <laughs> and they looked it up. <laughs> and they looked it up. So it was a daily across a daily telegraph for information. And you say, um, you know, uh, whatever it was, and who was the um, you know, it was some sort of complicated thing. Do you know, and even sales. things like who won the FA Cup in 1967, because there wasn't a place you could run. Because you couldn't look it up then. Exactly. Unless you happened to have a, you know, yearbook there or something, you couldn't. Yeah. Uh, and so you would ring the Daily Telegraph inf- information service. The other, the other um, permanent yeah, feature. You always had to have, was it, uh, what was the film guide called? Halliwell's? No, I can't remember. That. Halliwell's film, film guide. Yes. Halliwell's film guide, which you had to have a copy of, so you, you could did. look up. Yeah, what the seventh yeah, movie, could, movie was. Yeah, yeah, if you wanted to know what order Jack Nicholson's film, Jack Nicholson's films came out. You had to go to that. You couldn't. That's right. Yeah, there was no Wikipedia. Isn't that weird? You'd ring up and someone would answer the phone. They would. <laughs> they would. Oh, no, really? and we, we were. There was another feature of London life, sadly departed, which we were discussing only the other day with uh, Will Birch, which was Keith Prowse, the Keith ticket Prowse. agent, Keith which Prowse. was on a, on every corner in the West End, wasn't it? Yeah. You know? And if you wanted a ticket to go and see My Fair Lady at wherever it was on, or you wanted to go and see Judas Priest at Hammersmith Odeon when it was still called the Hammersmith Odeon. That's the way you would go, Keith Prowse Ticket Agency. There was no mystery about buying tickets in those days, was there? You know, no, you, at all. You, you, went, you didn't need your, your credit card. It's No, it's um, – but i tell you the thing that I really – Golden uh, Egg, that's the other thing. We were talking to egg. Mike Pat, he of the Wombles. Yeah. And I don't know actually if it ever came up in the conversation. We did a, a, a pod with him uh, last week about his memoir, and he was talking about in the late 60s, he said his idea of a date, when he was going to take a girl out for a meal, he would take her to the Golden Egg. <laughs> they presumably shall I tell you, and chips and a shall, Pepsi. I, shall I tell you, when um, we've had him on this podcast telling the story before, but it's worth reminding ourselves of it, 
Richard Williams when he was working for the Melody Maker in the early, in the early 70s. Yeah. Um, a tape arrived at his home um, with a note from it, no, with it, same from Brian Ferry. You know, this is, my, this is my group called Roxy or whatever. Would you like yeah. to listen to it? And so when he listened to it and was impressed with it and got in touch with Brian Ferry and they arranged to meet these two immensely fashionable young men <laughs> at the core, at the molten core of swing in London, 1972 or whatever. Where did they meet? They met at the Golden Egg on the Egg. Group. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, wasn't the, it. it wasn't the Grout show. Didn't exist. Which was a you know. pivotal moment in their getting a recording well, deal. Was, was it? So you could one. say, uh, you know, the, the idea of the very genesis of Roxy music yeah, yeah. would have been over a, a frothy coffee. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know, um, some ghastly scrambled eggs. Oh, that's amazing. I tell you what, I miss though is loads of calves, not coffee shops, calves. Yeah, and, independent know, calves. Where we used to work in Carnival Street and around there, there was always just a generally Italian-run independent calves. And the there, were no, there, there were no great shakes in the culinary steaks, but it sort of didn't matter. And, and do you remember, you used to get about these places in the morning and there would be piles of uh, of sandwiches it, it, which had been compiled from sliced bread yeah. and uh, slices of processed ham or whatever. Already starting to kind of uh, <laughs> overheat in the window. Probably with a wasp or two on them, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and you look at it and say, I don't think I'm going for the egg and crust today. <laughs> Somebody's got there first. <laughs> but in those days, Mark, imagine this. You could go into a, into a pl- one of those places and you'd ask for a thing called a coffee. And it would only come in one variety. It was a coffee. You know what I mean? That's right. There weren't, there weren't different sorts of coffee. There no. was just coffee or tea. And, you know, and the tea would very often be dispensed from a teapot from into a teapot. which. Bright orange tea. Into which the milk had already been decanted. Yeah. <laughs> and it would cost about 10p. Probably not that, you know. Did you, when you started at Smash Ears, did we still have luncheon vouchers? Oh, yeah, lunch vouchers, which is great. I used to save them up, actually. And, and me and, and my wife used to go out to a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> I never spent them in town, but I'd go, go out to China to have a free, effectively a free meal. It was so exciting. Now, you say you can't do that anymore. Do you know why not? Because not only is luncheon vouchers gone, Chinese restaurants have gone. I don't know what your experience is around, around, around Leafy Chiswick, but around my way, I was only saying this to the lady wife the other day. Indian and Chinese restaurants, you don't see them. in, in, in the, They're not as available as this they used to be. This is some of that to do with the fact that people now appreciate this kind of authentic Chinese food, and then there's the Chinese food you get out in the garden suburbs or whatever, which is basically um, pork balls and crimson paint. <laughs> <laughs> with some boiled rice. But when you go in and have dim sum, you know, in uh, in Gerrard Street, it's a totally different experience. But, uh, but, also, but also, you can go and buy all that stuff in the kind of Marks and Spencer's yeah, you can. You, nowadays. That's, I suppose yeah. that's, that's one, of the, one of the reasons, you know. So the idea that, you, you know, the, the Indian restaurant where you can go and have two pints of lager and float a curry, you know, it's sadly, sadly <laughs> gone. <laughs> Do you remember we used to go, Float a curry, that's right. <laughs> Do, you remember, oh, Do you remember when we used to go to the, the Chinese restaurant in, in, in Soho? Huge. It, it was on three floors. Or it, was absolutely, it was a canteen, wasn't it? Massive canteen. Yeah. And and it had the world's rudest waiters. Do you remember this? Yeah. It was called the Wong Key, which Neil Tennant changed to the Wang Key. That's right. <laughs> the Wang Key. <laughs> the Wang Key. Oh God! Oh, it was, you know what a what a salon of wit was the Smashes office in nineteen eighty two. You know, kind of Bloomsbury Group. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear, we thought we were so funny. The Word Podcast. Clearly, there is no plan. So, what else has been going on in the last week? We've uh, we did recordings with Joe Boyd, very and Mike, good. Mike Bat. Did you? Did you? We didn't mention it in the course of the conversation with either of them. 
there is a connection, isn't there? That Joe Boyd was the guy who got Mike Bat in to be the drummer of Hapsash and the Coloured Coat way back in. Yes. Did he? Yes. Well, it's mentioned in Mike Bat's book, you know. And I and thought Joe it was Boyd- one extraordinary coincidence that, you know, we talked to one of them on one day and the other of them on, on the next My day. God, and, they, and they had a connection yeah. going back from 1966 probably or something like that. I love that part of his book. The idea he was what was arguably the most fashionable, the most achingly fashionable group at the time, Hap Sash and the Coloured Coat. 20 minutes later, he's writing, um, you know, Wombling White Tie and Tails. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's a, it's an extraordinary book. Yeah. And so what else have we done this week? You spoke to the um, the I Apple chap. He, he, uh, Jan Gradval, the Swedish writer, has written a really, really good memoir about uh, ABBA. So that'll be up very soon. We did Nick Lowe, I think. I don't know if we oh, was Nick Lowe, yes. <laughs> Nick Lowe was fantastic. <laughs> Fantastically funny. There's a little trailer we put out of Nick Lowe talking about why being the support group is it's a so good thing. More enjoyable. Than being the headliner, it's just really he was really funny. he's brilliant, he's brilliant. Oh my goodness! And uh, so that just gives you an idea of some of the extraordinary range of what we provide here. And uh, it, it's and we said it before, but it bears repeating that um, you will get privileged and access to all this material in full, in glowing color where applicable. Uh, were you to become a Patreon supporter, and you're probably wondering. How do I become a Patreon supporter? Well, we have the answer to that, Mark, don't we? You just go to patreon.com slash word in your ear, and you'll find full details of all the various different ways that you could get involved. And who knows, if you if you um, go for the full, the full ticket, you can have the joy of joining us on the occasion of your birthday, to throw a conversational log on the word in your ear fire, as did the only the other week, uh, old friend Geltex, who was rather worrying that he may be losing touch with pop and rock. The Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink and it's like being in the pub. And we're joined by another very loyal, very supportive uh, birthday guest, uh, and a regular in our uh, Friday night quiz, Gel Text. Gel Text, lovely to see you. Love to see you. We should really be calling you by your real name. Or would you be happy to be called Gel Text? Uh, I, I asked to several things as long as right. people speak to me. Gel Text, aka Ian. Um, Gel Text, you've sent us a, a question. I think your question was that you were you felt disconnected from from music, or you didn't quite understand the fact that bands like the Killers and Green Day were playing enormous arena shows and you kind of thought that they'd, they'd disappeared that it was all over and suddenly you look around and they're, they're actually far far bigger than they ever were is that right well, yeah i i think it's a uh, it's just it's it's followed on really from the collapse of the music press you know i i bought music a music magazine either week every week or every month since the summer of 1979 uh f- Apparently, following you two guys around wherever you were working, <laughs> <'cause> obviously, <laughs> like, I made yeah. your work, like, uh, you know. And and when when word finished, uh, I I didn't, I, I don't, n- nothing hits the spot, you know, because uh, as you say, everything is looking backwards. Maybe these days, um, then uh, you know, as I've said last year, I listened to Radio Six a lot, and then last year they reorganised. The playlist, it's been going 20 years, so they, they're shifting to a younger audio, audience. <laughs> we hardly to listen to it. So I, so I listen to no new music. I, I read no press. I have no idea that the only music news I get is what you share, in, in you know, either in your podcast or we do on Friday nights. That's pretty limiting. <laughs> it, it is limiting. You know, it's Tom Waits, XTC, Bruce Springsteen. That's about it, really. Yeah, yeah, it is. You know, and that's the only way I know who's who's touring. But I say the big biggest shock, really, uh, as I said, that, that you know, when England won the one of their games, there was a video on YouTube with the killers sitting on stage watching the penalty shootout, and when the when the final penalty well went in, they kicked into Mister Brightside, and it's like, well, I I. I am aware they they released a second album, but I didn't know they'd done anything since. 
And, and Green Day, well, I remember American Idiot coming out, but nothing since. And there they are playing enormous stadiums. But Dave and I talk about this a lot. I mean, a lot of it must be surely to do with the fact that, that maybe 30 years ago, we were listening to the radio and the radio was playing yeah. a lot of stuff. And, and also they were playing in shops and you were just aware you couldn't escape the sound of Oasis when Oasis happened. You couldn't get through life without knowing what Oasis sounded like. But now, instead of music coming to you, you clearly have to go to the music, don't you? You have to, you have to go out and find it. And unless you're looking for Green Day and, uh, and specifically following what they're up to, you're not going to know. Well, exactly. You know, and I used to work with the radio on, and I, I find that I can't concentrate with the radio now. So I work in silence. Uh, and so that, that, Avenue has been lost to me as well. <laughs> I think really this much. sounds so sad. <laughs> I, can't, I, I tell you, uh, the, the extraordinary Stay with thing us. is, the extraordinary thing is, Green Day. Okay, now I, I don't know if anybody knows this off, off the top of their head. How long have Green Day been going? They've been, uh, their first album came out when I was posted to Germany, so it was about 19, 1993. Okay, so Green Day have been going. It's 31, at least 31 years. 31 years. My <laughs> eldest lad loved uh, them. He had posters uh, of them all over his bedroom. Uh, the whole notion of bands like that at any stage in popular music history was that they were kind of here today and gone tomorrow. That, that's what they were there for, you know. Whereas to be contrasted with, I don't know, Led Zeppelin, who are going to go on forever. Well, if you look at the career of Led Zeppelin, it's flash in the pan compared to Green Day, 30 years and counting. That's the thing. Bands go on for such a long time. And my theory is that they're far bigger 20 years later than they are at the time. And I had a, a case of this this week. I've just been looking, having to look up this, these names to remind myself. Um, because I said to Alex this week, I said, I just heard about two upcoming concerts taking place at the Tottenham Stadium next year. The Tottenham Stadium has a capacity of just over 60,000. Okay. So that's a lot of people. And the two acts are Imagine Dragons, who I kind of heard of. And Catfish and the Bottle Men, who I'm not ashamed to say I had literally never heard of. Until oh, they've been said, around a while. I don't know what they sound like. They've been around a while. It is Al extraordinary, isn't Alex it? Alex told me they're, 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 they're huge in the world of landfill indie, and I'm completely <laughs> prepared to believe him. No doubt about that at all. But the idea that 60,000 people could be trooping up the Seven Sisters, you know, the Tottenham High Road, and people thinking, that's rather a lot for a football match. You think, no, they're going to see Catfish and the Bottle Men. You know, it's just absolutely extraordinary. And, you know, the, your whole notion of who's big and who's not nowadays has gone to part, really. It, stri it strikes me. I was just looking at Wembley Arena. I mean, that's only eight or 9,000, you know, just, just a couple of minutes ago. Vance Joy, Tiwa Savage and the Composers. <laughs> All, oh, I've all sold out Wembley Arena. I've literally never heard of any yeah. of them. So they've crept up behind me and got that big. I suppose it's it's the internet, isn't it? You know, the, it you, you 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 contact some kind of co community of fans and you you just slowly build them up over a period of time, over quite a number of years, probably. I'm sure none of these acts have arrived last year. You know, is they're all probably the culmination of a ten year campaign to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Well, it's no different, really, from, from the rest is history or, or the rest is politics podcasts selling out, you know, the Royal Albert Hall or something. Because if you don't listen to those podcasts, you're simply no, unaware you wouldn't, of no, we're, people we're, 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 yeah, we're all in silos nowadays, aren't we? You know, whereas yeah. we didn't used to be. We used to be all in one big barn. And um, we, knew, we knew what was going on. And we knew, we also knew what to dislike. <laughs> I remember Paul Paul Morley writing this at the end of me years ago. Oh, oh, somewhere I can't remember where. He said, the great thing about the charts is it gives you things to hate as well as things to love, which I think is a really good point. Mm. <laughs> they used to sit, sit there and watch Top of the Pops, and nobody ever got up at the end of Top of the Pops and went, that was really good. Did they ever? No. <laughs> not ever. They just go, well, so You've got pops. as much fun, if not possibly more, at the things you hated. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You could moan about them collectively. 
probably be really good for everybody if, you know, if there was a TV program where you saw Taylor Swift, Imagine Dragons, and Catfish and the Bottle Men, and, you know, somebody who's put together a single for Christmas, you know, all at the same time. We'd all have, uh, we'd all be part of the national conversation, wouldn't it, in the same but way? But if Top of the Pops, if Top of the Pops consisted entirely of things that you liked and approved of, then you wouldn't get that, that wonderful feeling that when something terrible came on, it, it just reminded you of how fantastic the group you liked actually were, because there was something to compare it with. Those are important, I think. So anyway, yes. I was doing a radio interview this week on Times Radio with Fee Lover and Jane Garvey, uh, plugging my book. And uh, and uh, they uh, Fee slipped me a question I wasn't expecting at all. What's the most dreadful question you can ever be asked, Mark? Oh, my God, that's good. So it can't <laughs> be something as simple as what's the worst group in the world because we've kind of... Oh, no, I, 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 I've probably done that. No, no, it was, uh, it was... So what are you listening to at the moment? Oh, God. Oh, that's awful. And I just go blank. Oh, I know. But, not, the, it's, but I it's awful to... because you don't know what to say that's not going to make you look ridiculous or like you're trying too hard. Yeah, absolutely. And I did. But anyway, uh, you know, the, the point is, I just, there's tons of stuff. Be listening on Spotify, whatever, and you don't kind of know what it is. You sort of know to name and it goes away. Whereas, you know, if you go back to the point you were making, Gel Text, about how you're, you kind of, Tastes were formed in the days of music press. It was you saw a picture of them first of all, you knew their name, then you heard them. You know what I mean? And then eventually you might go and see them or something. So the ones you knew, you kind of knew very well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Whereas nowadays, with uh, with streaming, it's very easy to become exposed to loads of things that. You don't remember at all. They just drift by. Well, well, I think the other thing is with the music, and I think Mark Commode said this in one of his books about about critics. Critics' role: it, you trust a critic. If a critic raves about a record or a film or whatever, it gives you more. In, you know, well, I, he was right about this, so he must be right about that. So you will actually go out and 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 seek that out that product out that either that record and i remember buying an album by a swedish band called soundtrack of their lives based on a on, on a on a ray review and and it's one of my favorite records well yeah absolutely whereas nobody does that anymore because you'll you'll hear it first yeah. and uh, and you'll read about it a long way second actually a long way second <laughs> you know there's loads of things that i I'm aware of uh, hearing on Spotify and liking that I know literally nothing about. <laughs> and I literally don't care. You know what I mean? They they have kind of odd names. And so you wouldn't know if they're a bunch of Swedish producers or they're a group from Brazil or they're from Milton Keynes, you know, or solo artists. You, you wouldn't know, know nor care because they, you've they've found their way to you. That's all you're bothered about, you know. Whereas their identity used in matter like crazy in the days when you read about them and saw a picture of them first. Um, but that's all changed. Well, they were liking them was an expression of your own character, wasn't it? Whereas now it's it's true. You can listen to all sorts of stuff and it's just what the sound of it is is important. What it yeah. looks like, what it represents yeah. doesn't matter in the slightest. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that's you know, to do with just getting older, actually. I don't know. Yeah, right. it's possible. <laughs> well, it's also, you know, if somebody asks you, like, you know, Fee did, what are you listening to? You know, I mean, literally, I listen to th millions of things. Whereas if I was 17, I'd have my answer ready. Yeah. <laughs> to the worst. To Steely Dan and nothing else. <laughs> nothing else. Because yeah, everything exactly. else is terrible. Bob Marley and the way <laughs> Anyway. Well, I don't know if that's I don't know if that's uh, lifted your anxiety, gel text, about this at all. <laughs> Man shrugs. It's, it's it's not with us. You're, you're, you're giving up on rock. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just Give it a little longer. I think that uh, there's there's so much stuff out there. It's hard to know where to start. But that, that is the that is the fact. That's the thing. You know. 90% of the times when people ask me about anything to do with music, you know, oh, is it the same as it used to be? The, the, the only logical answer is, of course it's not the same as it used to be, because there's so much more of it. You can't imagine how much more of it there is. You know, go back and count how many records came out in 
1978. Now go and count how many... You know, those statistics about how much material is uploaded to YouTube every day. What was on Spotify? Was it, wasn't it in millions? No, well, it's just the untold day? millions. Yeah, absolutely, it's every day. So you know, because it just it doesn't cost anything to do it. You know, so no. it's, and it's not like you're manufacturing it and distributing it and sending it in a truck and getting somebody to put it out in a record shop. Those are all processes that required human beings. These are not processes that require human beings. You know, there are record companies that are, are in the business of IP management nowadays. You know, it's, it's a completely different thing, completely different. But, you know, in exchange, we have access to far more than anybody's ever had. Does that mean that we value it less? It probably does. It probably does. Yeah. Well, I, f- I find I go back to listen to the same songs on YouTube over and over again because they're the ones I like. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm sure. Mm. Or, uh, you know, it's even more the case with kind of physical products, you know, that uh, that if you've, got a, if you've got an object in your living room, you have a greater attachment to it than something that's just available down there. That's a product of the modern world, though, isn't it? Which is I have, I have three minutes available. Am I going to risk that? With something I might not like, or am I going to go back to something I know I do like? Uh, it's very yeah. simple just to go back to to the latter. But anyway. Well, look, thanks for raising that topic. It, it may well stir some responses from the uh, from the massive, as we used to call them in the days of Word magazine. <laughs> um, and uh, when was it's your birthday, Deltex? It, it was bank holiday weekend. Right, Okay. And I, had a, I had a three-day celebration for the first time. Well, you that's devil. Good. That's a festival. That's, well, a, yeah. no, that's a Notting Hill carnival. That's not it a is. <laughs> Very good. And yeah, and you're off to you're off to Tuscany. Yes. Good. Take my book with you. Um, I will. So we may not. We may not uh, <laughs> yes, volunteer that information, Mark. I didn't. I no, didn't. No, that's very good. Thank you. Yeah, you never know. It may rain. You'll be very grateful. <laughs> You'll be grateful anyway. <laughs> I can yeah. read it to the locals. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> this podcast was brought to you by the Word. And-